Out there, welcome to the No Shit Cast. I'm your host, Matt Frazier. Woo! Thanks for joining us on our journey into the Internet College of Infinite Knowledge. My co-host for this evening's festivities, none other than the Gray Wizard of Historical Knowledge himself, Mr. Eric D. Smith. How are you tonight, Mr. Smith? I'm doing well. How are you, Matt? Man, I, if I could be happier. I'm not sure how I would e- elaborate that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. You know. Things are going very, very well then. I mean, considering what's happening. <laughs> uh, considering the state of the world. <laughs> I mean, I'm feeling like I really don't got much room to bitch about much. You know what I mean? That's that's kind of what I'm saying. <laughs> well, all <laughs> so, right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, things uh, uh, professionally are, are going phenomenal. <laughs> You know, like I said, I really, I really can't complain. And if I w- did, I would be being dishonest. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> big time. I even like the topography of where we live. Is that right? Yes, it is right. Topography, as in like the curvature or the, the shape gentle of the rolling land. landscape yeah, the that hills. we have. Yeah, and mm-hmm. then like being right on the border of where the last glacier came by, so that past that it's all absolutely flat yeah so it's like really flat and green and then just a little bit on the other direction it's all hilly and then there's caves and there's of course different kinds of trees and stuff because like when i lived in texas it was very flat yeah (laughs) and not as many trees you know i traveled a lot uh and lived in other states and and right and uh it's amazing the impression of what ohio looks like or is like is to people that have either never been to Ohio or have never visited really? Ohio. Yeah. What it's is that? All, because like? it's all flat and cornfields. It's That's... like, it's not fucking Iowa. No. Like this no. is, <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, but, um, well, you see that picture that I have on Facebook, right? Uh, the mm-hmm. apps, uh, the, uh, after work absence. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, right, with right. The, with with the with the you're not gonna say where, but the mountain in the background. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> okay. You good thing you said that. Yeah. <laughs> I've been dropping names everywhere. I know your streets. And you're numbers. horrible about that shit, dude. <laughs> some anonymity, just a little. That's it. Just there's some crazy fucking people out there that listen to the shit on the internet. You know, <laughs> I just don't necessarily want them knowing. That's our fans. How to get the right. <laughs> uh, for, well, fortunately, they're rabid. Yeah. We love you guys. Don't come visit me. <laughs> come not, to my house instead. Uh, we'll talk me, about religion. Send me something on uh, Messenger. <laughs> That's about all the you closer know, I want to get. It's been a while since I had any proselytizers. Uh, come knocking on your door. Yeah. Well, you I, live above a bar. I know. You probably figure that that's not. I uh, know. <laughs> it sucks. <laughs> I live above a pub. He's got folks. He's got the best fucking bachelor pad. Okay. <laughs> it's like the most ideal spot. It's got a yeah. great view. It does. It's like Especially amazing. Fourth of July. Yeah. And if you like the people watch and shit, which yeah. you do. Yeah. It's great too. So it's just like this weird. I. You got like the best bachelor pad. I was sitting out in the balcony and this girl and guy was walking by and he was looking up at me and then she looked up at me and I gave him the old uh, Balkan sign. Yeah. Okay. And they kind of laughed at each other and waved back. (laughs) (laughs) It was funny. It was weird. Who's that fucking weirdo up there? I know, right? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, he's a nerd too. (laughs) Oh, he's a drunk and a nerd. (laughs) No, it's kind of cool because uh, you get those great pub stories of oh, conversations and shit like that, you know. And I don't think people realize how inter- you know the people that don't go and engage in that regularly. That's mm. a, fa- I mean, I can't do it because if I get drunk and someone says something stupid to me, I can barely bite my tongue when I'm sober. <laughs> if I'm fucking drunk, it just <laughs> and I and I don't make friends. 
easily drunk. I, I don't. I don't work. I don't. I don't make friends easily when I'm drunk. <laughs> but um, people that already kind of know me are okay with that, right? But <laughs> yeah. you don't have that problem. No. And you get to talk to like really interesting people. Oh gosh, yeah. Uh, and you give them the old uh, liquor elixir, man, uh, and it just lubricates them up, and they just wah, <laughs> tell you all kinds of shit. Man, when the first couple of months I moved in there. This lady tried to drive backwards through the alley. And it's like a really short alley, just yeah, maybe 50 yards. Right. And it leads out to a very main street. Yeah. And she tried to go backwards, and she got the car stuck catty-cornered. And couldn't get it back out? And no, and was stuck there. And, like, the police came. And when she hit it, she hit it so hard, she had this lucky rabbit's foot that was in her car. <laughs> and it went out the window. And then when they towed everything away, the rabbit's foot was still there. So I've got it like on in my stairwell to this day. It's yeah. like at the front of the stairwell. It just sucks up negativity when it's people a, go. In. It's the unlucky rabbit's <laughs> yeah. foot. You leave that fucker outside. It, it huh? had definitely uh, lost all of its charm ability <laughs> and had ran out of juice because it, she. Oh man, like they had her right under my window. So I was like there listening to what she was saying, and she, she and drunk. She her she, she her boy she her boyfriend was cheating on her, and she found out. Oh, she was from man. Columbus. She drove to a random city and hit a random bar, bar. took some pills, drank some booze, oh, and man. ended up underneath my window crying and to not understand. Police. Yeah, not understanding what she had done or why they were handcuffing her or why they were taking her yeah. away. And it was sad, man. That's I too felt bad, bad for dude. her, you know. I've never seen that girl again. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's uh, going to a strange bar and taking pills, <laughs> uh, no matter how bad your heart is yeah, broken, is not a good idea. Because this just compounded all of oh, the yes. issues ultimately. Yeah, yeah. It's that I don't give a but fuck. Well, you will. <laughs> I will say that at that moment in time, at least, the cops treated her really, really nice, man. Yeah. Like she resisted and. Um, you know, but they were really nice to her. They they tried to explain what was going on to her. <laughs> yeah, like listen, you you're go, you're getting arrested. <laughs> so lots of stories living above a bar is the is the point. It's never dull, is it? Never dull. Never dull. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's always something going on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Even in the mornings and stuff, like they do beer deliveries around yeah six a.m. five thirty a.m. and then people come in and clean it in the morning and stuff so there's stuff going on down then there then right and then at night literally people cheering and singing to yeah. songs and um having a great time and yeah. laughing yep and, definitely yeah. so there and it's all coronavirus whatever aside like a- and everything they i don't they are packing them in there like i don't know i think they're not supposed to be but they everybody I mean, it's like people are standing in clusters when there's not that many people in there. Yeah. So and and but I mean, like it's been pretty packed. Man. Well, it, it, we you know before the show we were talking a little bit about how the uh, numbers are skyrocketing in some places <laughs> now. All of a sudden, yeah. after they've started releasing or lightening up the whole lockdown stuff, and yeah. I, yeah. and 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 and, the, and there's been people gathering in masses huge crowds lately and for tremendous reasons but <laughs> there is still a contagious virus you know highly contagious virus is you channeling uh, trump we tremendous tremendous reasons. <laughs> god that, that just sounds like one of his catchphrases dude that hurt my soul i can't <laughs> believe you compared it <laughs> um so what else is going on? <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is going on? I've been in living life. above a bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need to get like a cushion for my swing. That's for one thing. Yeah, yeah. I've been sitting out there on that back balcony. Not, man, that's the worst thing I've ever said on this show. I've been sitting out there on that back balcony. No, I need a cushion. I need for a my cushion swing. for my butt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh joy. Uh, I'm I sure I'm sure when you ask me if there's anything else going on, you did not mean if I needed a cushion <laughs> for my butt, right? Okay. I sure as fuck wasn't thinking about that. <laughs> no. Uh-uh. <laughs> well, okay, so there's been some big shit that's happened. We uh our boy Elon Musk delivered two astronauts to the International Space Station. Yep, all safe and sound. Yep. Landed all three boosters. 
and the crew capsule made it back. No problem. So now, you know, we're not <laughs> renting the, <laughs> from the Russians to go to and from space again anymore. Yeah. That's so nice. that's pretty cool. That was big, big, big news. I mean, o- there's obvious other big news, coronavirus, uh, the Black Lives Matter stuff, all of that. But we're trying to do something other than that. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's plenty of that out there. And trust me, I'm watching it uh, and consuming it probably you too just as much as anybody else. It's just me. Yeah. No. Not really. Yeah, you know, well, as okay, as much as you normally would. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Which yeah. Is I mean, I'm aware of it, but I, I typically don't read a newspaper, watch the news, or, yeah. or, and you're really happy. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. I think there might be something to that. There is a yeah. I stopped in 1993. I would watch all the Star Trek, right, and then and it was all like kind of hopeful and interesting, and then the news would come on, and and around 1993, it seemed like there was this weird change. It used to be different, but then around then, they always led with the deaths, the murders, the robberies and stuff. The top of the news right. was always the worst shit that they could find. And then it would dribble down all the way to, like, sports. Sports and weather. Yeah. 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 And and that's when I stopped watching news. Before that, it didn't. I don't know. It didn't seem that way. Maybe if that's in my head. I don't know. But I could watch the news and learn a little something about local things yeah. and world things. Yeah. But then all of a sudden, every day, right after watching Star Trek, how many Bloom people died? Yeah. yeah, and I'm Bloom like, and man, Doom. that sucks. So I just kind of tuned out and never went back. I listened to NPR, but and it sucks that it's all about the bad things right now. Yeah, but that's just so prevalent that that you wouldn't escape it right. if you were any kind of a news channel. Right. Um, but I largely listen to that not because it's NPR, but because I wanted to listen to talk radio. And that's the only talk radio I know of that yeah. I can get, like, in this area. Right. Well, there's a lot of the... It, it, most of the uh, big talk radio is on AM. Is it? Yeah. So maybe I should try yeah. AM or something. <laughs> and a lot of it's sports, and then it's and then you get into the really, like, political-type stuff that's uh, um, either... You know, most of those radio, DJ, uh, radio uh, commentators, talk show commentators, mm-hmm. are very strongly politically biased one way or the other yeah and it's i mean it's all out there um radio seems to be more uh right wing and uh main what you would call traditional mainstream media is more left wing Mm. so they sort of are juxtaposed against each other that way um and it's kind of interesting because the methodology with which the news is consumed. So the people that consume AM radio tend to be people that are doing other things. Can't you, sit down in front of a television and watch someone if you're okay. so you can listen to it. So that ideology also seems to permeate the working class type folks that are driving trucks and and doing things for a living, working hard where they can't watch. You know, mm, they have gotcha. but they can listen to it. Yeah. And um, and then when you like the mainstream or television media tends to be more your uh, professional upper class type folks, you know, uh, with the more left wing. And I and I, and I always find it kind of odd that it's I, I don't know which is which begets which. Right. Is it mm. is it the uh, is it that those people need that medium? So that's where the. The source goes, or is it the other way around? Is it that's where the source went, so that's the uh, ideology yeah. of the people that consume that particular medium? It's hard to say, and I'm fairly anti-political to the point where yeah. it's hard for me to make judgment calls on those things. Yeah, I took a survey once where it was supposed to rate. It had like like match my candidate or, or something thing. like that. Well, yeah. it was just five or eight. Uh, ratings. Yeah, and they were, and I can't remember what they was, but they basically were like. Su- Supposed to be like your political spectrum. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The world's smallest political quiz. You Man, answer eight questions, and it shows you like on a square whether you're left, well, right. This was no, this was a, or, or these were like um, bar charts gauges that went mm-hmm. from uh, left to right, mm-hmm. and then and however far they went was what you were right. Okay, like you are that meant, mattered the most or whatever. But mine were literally all equal in the equal, middle. Yeah. <laughs> so what's that mean? I mean, oh, like, like on this on the square yeah. chart, I'd be like right in the middle, right in the dead center. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't be leaning any way. I'd literally be like true neutral. Like, I, it, well, <laughs> and because that, I mean, that person has to exist, and here you are. Yeah, but it's <laughs> right. weird because they all spit yeah. out that same thing, man. right? Right. 
Yeah, I don't. I don't know, know what that a, means. I don't know how. I don't know. Like, there's that. There's this thing. It's like I can't remember the website. It's like my political candidate, or you know, where where you an, you go in and it asks you a bunch of questions. You answer and it tells you basically who to vote for. Like this is the candidate that most aligns. With I don't your... think I could trust that. <laughs> and 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 there's things like these political quizzes and stuff you can take. It'll sort of tell you where you line up. But the point isn't to me. I don't necessarily need to know where I'm at. I need to know where I should be. Mm. Does that make sense? Like, so we take these quizzes. They're so fucking narcissistic in a sense, right? They're so me 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 me. It's like. I'm going to answer because I know everything. <laughs> so I'm going to answer this quiz and then it's going to find the candidate that most aligns with me. And what that's the wrong to me. That's the wrong question. The question isn't which candidate would best make me happy. The question is, is which candidate would be the best for the country? Is that You know what I mean? That's like a different thing. So I find it all really strange, mm. like whether it's telling you anything beneficial really or not, you know, because maybe you shouldn't be a fucking douchebag or whatever, or a, or a mop head. <laughs> Muppet. <laughs> you know, and, and educate yourself on some shit and get some values and things. <laughs> Just saying. I don't know. <laughs> All right. So uh, are we done with that? Well, that's like our question? new uh, show question. Yeah. Yeah, we just have a bullshit session. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it works. Apparently, I think so. I like yeah. it. It's fun, huh? I'm, yes. That's all we do anyway, sit around and bullshit. Well, I think there's a bit more going on. <laughs> Dep there's a bit on two different sides, I think. There's a bit more going on in terms of what we're discussing philosophically. For sure. It, yeah. uh, and, and also, too, as uh, personifications of ourselves. Well, I want to say that <laughs> I don't. I, I don't feel like I'm qualified to be giving advice that way anymore. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, no. I don't feel like <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't I, like when it comes to talking about shit, like, you know, some of the hot button issues on how people should be behaving or living their lives and all this kind of stuff. I think I'm kind of done. Mm. Um, it's I, I I'm 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 just gonna worry about me. <laughs> I'm gonna take care of my shit. Because yeah, the other and, way can be pretty never ending. Yeah, there's a lot of people that. Well, my my outlet now is making fun of uh, news articles and pseudoscience and, and that kind of stuff. I'm definitely so. going to make fun of the fifth state of matter. Are you? Yes. Oh, I think you're going to be surprised, Bubba. Okay. All right, so we're going to get to some articles now. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this one comes from fizz.org. Uh, actually, be careful making fun of this because this was sent to us by someone that's connected to the show. Does Actually, you should make fun of he, it as much as possible. Uh, does he they, think? Does he really like the fifth state of matter that much? Would the, it would offend him if I made fun? I don't think so. I think he would okay. want to know your absolute honest opinion. <laughs> yes. Now that I'm thinking about it. <laughs> it, that will be far easier than trying to think of something funny about the fifth state of matter. You don't believe this? No. It's I'm saying I'm not. I don't think I can be humorous about it. I was only joking about being humorous. Oh, okay. I'm only joking about being humorous, man. I'm not really going to. I mean, I might be able to, <laughs> but I don't know how, man. <laughs> we'll find out. Yeah. Uh, quantum fifth state of matter observed in space for the first time. So, what? It's been observed in the left shoe before, but not in space, right? Left shoe? Yeah, or somewhere else, like on Earth. Yeah. Okay. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it can be anywhere. It doesn't I'm have guessing. to be in your left shoe. <laughs> Scientists have observed the fifth state of matter and space for the first time, offering unprecedented insight that could help solve some of the quantum universe's most intractable conundrums. Research showed Tuesday. Ball, uh, Bose Einstein Bose. condensate. Yeah. Yeah. Bose Einstein condensate. The existence of which was predicted by Albert Einstein, an Indian ma Indian mathematician. <laughs> Nath Bose. Satran Satinath Bose. Uh, his last name's Bose. Almost <laughs> a sorry, <laughs> almost a century ago, are formed when atoms of certain elements are cooled to near absolute zero, zero degrees Kelvin, or minus two hundred seventy three point one five degrees Celsius. Yeah, did we talk about it on the show once before about there being like below zero? Wasn't it when? Well, zero absolute zero was when even the atoms yeah. stop, like everything stops. Did we talk about that on the show? We may have. Okay. Yeah. D yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> this is there's been 157 of these things, man. 
Uh, at this point, the atoms become a single entity with quantum properties, wherein each particle also functions as a wave of matter. Uh, Bose-Einstein condensates straddle the line between the micro macroscopic world governed by forces such as gravity and microscopic plane ruled by quantum mechanics. So, big shit acts different. The physics that affect large things is different than the physics that affect things at a microscopic level, okay? And I'm, I'm making sure I understand this, right? So then there's this, they're looking for this unifying theory because you can't use the same laws of physics like when you're figuring out how to make an airplane fly that you use to figure out how atoms fucking connect to each other and stuff. They don't act the same, right? Yeah, no, uh-uh. No, and and I think too that because because when they go to absolute zero and they line up, they line up in a lattice kind of a formation, yeah, much like crystals do, right, you know? right. And so when one area is being affected because they're lined up like that, another area will be affected down the way, right? Like okay. a, like a like they're all lined up, like, like they're a connected, sheet. like on a yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that. That I, that's what I got out of that. Okay, was that they act as individual particles and also as a wave of matter because they're connected in that fashion. Uh, scientists believe BECs uh, contain vital clues to mysterious phenomena such as dark energy, the unknown energy thought to be behind the universe's accelerating expansion. Mm -hmm. But BECs are extremely fragile. The slightest interaction with the external world is enough to warm them past their condensation threshold. Yeah, that's dissidence. Dissidence is that background, um, sometimes what they call it, phantom energy. Yeah. Or phantom particles. Okay. Particles that just kind of pop into existence. And then, then they're gone. Yeah, yeah, but it causes enough heat that it can disrupt something that's at absolute zero. Because the idea, like you pointed out, is nothing's moving. So, so these, just the slightest increase in temperature gets things moving. Maybe super slowly, but they will start moving around. Yeah. Um, I said, did I already read that? Okay. This makes it nearly impossible for scientists to study on Earth where gravity interferes with the magnetic fields required to hold them in place for observation. Interesting, too. On Thursday, a team of NASA scientists unveiled the first results from BEC experiments aboard the International Space Station where particles can be manipulated free from Earthly constraints. Microgravity allows uh, us to confine atoms with much weaker forces since we don't have to support them against gravity. Robert Thompson uh, from the California Institute of Technology, Pasadena, told AFP. The research published in the journal Nature documents several startling differences in the properties of BECs created on Earth and those aboard the International Space Station. For one thing, BECs in terrestrial labs typically last a handful of milliseconds before disappearing. Aboard the ISS, the BECs lasted for more than a second, offering the team an unprecedented chance to study their properties. Very so nice. somehow this is going to give me crazy fast computers. Yes. You, you know what I'm saying? That, like, yes. You see what I mean? Like them studying this in space is somehow going to give us like ridiculously re fast computers and, and shit. I would say yes. <laughs> uh, microgravity also allowed the atoms to be manipulated by weaker magnetic fields, speeding their cooling and allowing clearer imaging. Okay. Uh, creating the fifth state of matter, especially within the physical confines of a space station, is no mean feat. First, bosons, particles that have an equal number of protons and electrons, are cooled to near absolute zero using lasers to clamp them in place. The slower the atoms move around, the cooler they become. Now that makes sense. If you could free if you could like lock them in place, they'd be they'd be cold. Yeah. Cuz they're not move okay. As they lose heat, a magnetic field is introduced to keep them from moving and each particle's wave expands, cramming many bosons into a microscopic trap that causes their waves to overlap into a single matter wave, a property known as quantum degeneracy. Well, you could be a degenerate, but can you be a quantum degenerate? <laughs> Only out in space? I guess. Uh, the second the magnetic trap is released, in order for of scientists to study the condensate, however, the atoms begin to repel each other, causing the cloud to fly apart and the BEC to become too dilute to detect. It says, uh, most importantly, we conserve the atoms as they float entirely unconfined and hence unperturbed by external forces. 
That's pretty interesting, man. So this was only theorized about and could only be created for very short periods of time in labs on Earth. Yeah, and I'm, and like on airplanes and stuff, where like where they would fall, free fall, so yeah. that you, you would be weightless. Yep. They would do it on that those two. Oh, like the vomit comets. Yeah. Yeah, where they train astronauts yeah. and shit for weightlessness. But it but it but there haven't hardly been any studies on quantum effects in weightlessness. Like true weightlessness. So this is like one of the first times I've ever been able to experiment at all. Okay. And I don't know. It didn't really the article didn't really say that it meant anything in particular. Well, it, but it's it just said what that, they could do. Yeah, they could just got an unprecedented look into yeah. uh the f- No phys- conclusions, but they're they're doing it. Which but they're is doing uh, amazing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just like you said, freezing an atom and holding it suspended in a magnetic field where you don't have to where the magnetic field doesn't have to mm-hmm. be that strong because you're not fighting against gravity right is is an interesting thing so i'm sure there's going to be a lot more experiments <laughs> fucking boffins in space man changing everything <laughs> they'll be building cyclotrons or something out soon there in space. i would yeah. imagine well musk is i guess musk just told his spacex team that the number one priority is their capsule their spaceship and what they're going to do, because they're going to the moon, they just announced that too. Uh, NASA's teaming up with SpaceX to put people on the moon again. Mm. But they're going to actually build like a colony on the moon, mm-hmm. a space station on the moon. And um, the space capsules that they launch the astronauts and everything into space that are going to land on the moon are going to actually then become part of the oh, yeah. colony. Sure, yeah, they're going to te- dismantle that and use it to build build the colony. colony. Yeah, that's yeah. Cool. yeah. So I was watching like the team talk about what they're going to need to send. It's like 3D print or the Mars too, right? But the moon is your staging ground for and, yeah. and your learning experiment. Yeah, proving ground, yeah. Proving ground for a lot of shit. So lower gravity, less fucking uh liability, chances for things to go catastrophically wrong or not as high. It's not as far away. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, blah, 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 right? But, um, but yeah, they're going to land this thing, and then it's going to tie in to become the space station or the moon base that's going to ultimately be on the moon that they're going to send people to and from. That's really cool, man. Imagine that. Like, dude, I'm telling they, you, another 40 years, and we might be able to buy a ticket to go visit the moon. They should move the SSI space station out ISS? to the ISS? Yeah, yes, International ISS. Space <laughs> Uh, space station out to like the Lagrange point between the moon and the earth. Yeah. So that there's that hopping ground. Like a hopping point yeah. between the two. And then gravity would just hold it there, right? Yeah. yeah. Would you st- you'd still be weightless there though. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um SSI S- Space Station International. Yes. Is it spa- space special S- special space station it's, international. It's a space station international. <laughs> it's like that you you want you, you the French one. Not the- <laughs> There's a French space station? Uh, according to you. <laughs> <laughs> ISS. International space. Anyway. <laughs> um, this one comes from CBS News. Apparently, Saturn's largest moon is drifting off into space 100 times faster, faster, Eric, than uh, researchers previously thought. Dear God. They're just not sure what's going on out there. Spells doom for us all. It's definitely doom for those people on that moon. There's people on that moon? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. Titan, Saturn's largest moon, is distancing itself from its planet at rapid speed. Astronomers announced this week the moon is drifting away into space much faster than previously predicted, the scientists said, possibly altering their understanding of our solar system. It's kind of like a relationship, isn't it? You're just distancing yourself rapidly. You know, it's funny because in this one paragraph is everything I love about science. (laughs) Do break this down and let me know. Okay, so Titan's... uh, Titan... Saturn's largest moon is distancing, it, distancing itself from the planet at rapid speed. Fact. Somehow they've measured it now <laughs> accurately, and they're telling us what the fact is, right? Uh, uh, and, and those people are called astronomers. Uh, the moon is drifting away into space much faster than previously predicted. Scientists predicted that this was happening, and then they measured it and went, fuck, we were wrong. Yeah. It's that, really happening. <laughs> in two sentences, they're admitting that they predicted something, and then it ended up not being true. Full right. disclosure. Yep. Not 
That, well, hide that because that'll make <laughs> us look bad. There's none of that shit going on here. It's like, hey, we made this wild ass <laughs> guess and we were wrong. Yeah, uh, that's true, man. Uh, possibly uh, the mo- the moon is drifting away into space much faster than previously predicted. The scientists said, possibly altering their understanding of our solar system, which, and which is interesting, and the implications of which. Means we have to change some other shit now, too. right? <laughs> right. And they're just telling you that. Yep. They're not, you know, no. Not selling it. Not selling it. Not just, putting a spin on it. Just here's what it is. <laughs> Why do I love science and engineering and shit like that? Because they're at the front of the train. Front of that fucking train, baby. <laughs> Titan, which scientists believe could support life, is moving about a hundred times faster than researchers previously thought, according to a study published this week in the journal. Natural astronomy. Using data from NASA's Cassini spacecraft, which observed Saturn more than 13 years, for more than 13 years, astronomers found Titan is migrating at a rate of about four inches per year. Man. <laughs> it's moved 200 inches since I've been born. Oh my God. 10 feet. Is there anybody out there doing math trying to figure out how old I am? Stop that. Just saying. Yeah. Ten, it's not 10 feet, 200 inches. That's 120 inches. No. Yeah, 120 <laughs> inches. Whoa. So uh, almost, I, I just almost stuck with 20, inches. I'm almost like, 20 feet. It went, yeah, it went like 200 inches for me, but I'm just stay, staying in inches. God damn, you're old, dude. <laughs> Uh, Over half a century. It says it's not unusual for moons to slowly drift from their host planets. In fact, our own moon is constantly floating away from Earth at a rate about 1.5 inches per year. Do you blame it? However, Mm. due to Titan's distance from Saturn, scientists thought it was moving away from the planet more slowly. According to NASA's moon, as a moon orbits, its gravity creates a temporary bulge in the planet, causing tides as oceans move from side to side. Over time, the energy created by these interaction transfers from the planet to its moon, pushing it further away. I didn't know that. Yeah, I think our day is getting longer because the moon is going further away, too. And the ocean is pushing the moon away. Uh, Yeah, that's what they're saying. The swelling action is, over time, the energy created by this interaction transfers from the planet to the moon, pushing it further away. The gra- maybe, the- maybe so. <laughs> that's fucking, that's like magnets. Or I don't, yeah, I don't yeah. disagree. I don't know. <laughs> but don't worry about our moon. Earth will not lose the moon until both the Earth and the moon are engulfed by the sun in roughly six billion years or next week, depending on how things go, according to researchers yeah. at Caltech. Because would you be surprised? <laughs> no. Like hey, just come, we were really wrong about that six billion years that sun was. Gone. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, next week. Yeah, uh, I, I'm just pulling that. It's arbitrary. I'm not making a prediction anyway. While scientists know that Saturn formed 4.6 billion years ago, eh, give or take, <laughs> <laughs> the details on the formations of its rings and its system are more than of more than 80 moons are less certain knowing that Titan is currently 759,000 miles from the planet this new discovery suggests the whole system expanded relatively quickly okay poof yeah pop it was like goes the weasel and then it yeah. weasel weasels uh, this result brings an important new piece of the puzzle for the highly debated question of the age of the Saturn system and how its moons formed Lead author Valerie Laney said in a news release. Oh. Oh. Most prior work had predicted that the moons like Titan or Jupiter's moon Callisto were formed at an orbital distance similar to where we see them now. Said co-author Jim Fuller. This implies that the Saturnian moon (laughs) system and potentially its rings have formed and evolved more dynamically than previously believed. Hmm. God. All right, so the moons may be younger. Uh, yeah, I just, four inches, yeah. four inches per year, dude. That's flying. Hundred times faster than. <laughs> yeah, there's some math. So divide four by a hundred. Right. So what's that? Point oh four. No point. Yeah, point oh four inches. Four tenths of an inch per year, instead of four inches per year. 
<laughs> That's how much they were off. Yeah, over 100 times. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, this one comes from NoRidge.com. Scientists create a brain on a chip. <laughs> is this like uh, this is ginkgo the- biloba being forged with potatoes? What? <laughs> ginkgo biloba. <laughs> what the fuck is ginkgo biloba? It's a... Uh, it's an herb or and, something, right? Yeah, it's like it makes enhances, you supposed to make your pecker stiff or some shit like that. Makes you smarter. It does. Yeah. Oh, I got it, that wrong. <laughs> it dilates the capillaries in your brain. Okay. Providing more oxygen to your brain, which is one of the places that needs a lot of oxygen. Get you some capillaries. You know how like issues. exercise makes you smarter, right? It does. Yeah. Same concept. That's ginkgo biloba. You can take that instead of exercising to be smarter. So you don't have to exercise. Yeah, well, I mean, you should exercise, <laughs> but <laughs> but maybe you know, like they had like triscuits with ginkgo biloba, new from <laughs> Nabisco. Nabisco triscuits with ginkgo biloba <laughs> will not make your peckers stick. snack and be smart. Smart snack smart. When I saw this, I was thinking this could be a good thing because there's people that could. I'm hoping through transhumanism could use this. <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> the the not not that it's funny that you're hoping in desperation. It's just funny the implications of what you're saying. It's very scarecrow the state of affairs in the world. I think of like I think of it like going to see the wizard, uh-huh. and you're the scarecrow, right? And you get fixed, and you're like, I need a brain, bitch. Yeah. And he goes, Bam, brain, and yep. then you're good. Yeah, and then you're like, blah, 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 math, functioning member of society. Instead of a dysfunctioning. I'm just putting that out there. Or at least somebody with a capacity for critical thought or something. I don't know. Or that can flip a switch and get there. That's right. MIT engineer. (laughs) You know, I'm a dumbass, but. Oh, wouldn't that be? Yeah. (laughs) You'd have like an on off mode. Yeah. yeah. When would you ever want to be? I don't know. I don't know. The square root of the fun. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> MIT engineers have designed a brain on a chip smaller than a piece of confetti, so you could take it like acid, that is made from tens of thousands of artificial brain synapses known as memristers. 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 Wow. I don't think I've ever heard of that word before. Well, memristers are silicon based components that mimic the information transmitting synapses in the human brain. Now, I've heard those words before. The researchers borrowed from principles of metallurgy to fabricate each mermister. Mister 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 Mister. It's M E M R I S T O R. Memrister from alloys of silver and copper, along with silicon, silicone, silicon. Uh, when they ran the chip through several visual tasks, the chip was able to remember quotes, stored images, and reproduce them many times over. And versions that were crisper and cleaner compared with existing memrister designs made with unalloyed elements. Well, you don't want them fucking unalloyed elements. No, I don't. Their results published in the journal Nature Nanotechnology demonstrate a promising new memrister design for neuromorphic devices. <laughs> Well, that thank wasn't God. Far off. <laughs> neuromorphic has got to mean plugging it into people somehow, right? Uh, something that changes the neuro network of your brain would be my guess. Neuro for neuro network, morphic like polymorph. Yeah. Uh, electronics that are based on a new type of circuit that process information in a way that mimics the brain's neural architecture. Well, there you go. <laughs> we just had to keep reading. Yeah. Uh, such brain-inspired circuits could be built into small portable devices and would carry out complex computational tasks that only today's supercomputers can handle. Quote, so far, artificial synapse networks exist as software. We're trying to build a real neural network hardware for portable artificial intelligence systems. Oh, this is where we get the brains, Eric, for the... For robots? The bo- for the robots that, yeah. that uh, terminator up and fuck us all. Uncle Owen... This one's got a bad motivator. <laughs> oh, here we go again, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you got like motivator technology plugins, you know? Well, I mean, yeah, my immediate leap is to them becoming superior to humans in every way and then just deciding we're really just not necessary and <laughs> getting rid of all of us, right? But the it's more likely that it's going to be like R2-D2 and not quite, <laughs> Not quite Capable a practical. Of, yeah, <laughs> running around Until with a like rifle and three, six movies later, when you can get jets and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, okay. Uh, let's see. We're trying to build. We said that says uh, says G. Juan Kim, associate professor of mechanical engineering at MIT. Quote: Imagine connecting a neuromorphic device to a camera on your car and having it recognize lights and objects and make a decision immediately without having to connect to the internet. I don't like it. I love it. We hope to use energy efficient memristors to do those tasks on site in real time. Bro, I love that my car drives itself. I uh, yeah, you were saying that. Yeah. I fucking love that my car drives itself. And it doesn't really. It's like a it's like a souped up cruise control at the end of the day. It's not like Elon Musk's drives itself, right? It's it's like it keeps itself in its lane as long as it can see the lane. If, you can't, if there's no lines or whatever, it gets fucking lost. <laughs> so you got to keep your hand on the steering wheel anyway. And then if you don't keep your hand on the steering wheel, it beeps at you and will shut that system off. But it's... And then you just wreck. Ah. <laughs> well, no, it's, it'll also slow you down. That's good. It, it like start because it disconnects cruise control and everything. So you start, uh, you don't keep running down the highway at 70. It like shuts the whole thing off. So you start slowing down. Does that make sense? Yes. So if you have a heart attack while it's on, it's going to stop you. Nice. I can't promise you're not going to get rear-ended by a fucking Mack truck or something. Right. But, it will do that, but anyway, it's 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 such a labor saver. I can't wait till these things take over and start doing the shit I don't want to do. You know, <laughs> I want to watch a movie when I have to travel. Uh, fucking blip, turn yep. on R two D two. That's what he was. He asked yeah, droid. That's fucking right. handled the uh, Ship spa- stuff. Yeah. the space uh, junk computations or, yeah. and stuff. Yep. Memristors or memory transistors are a central element to. Mer- I think I said that. And a neuromorphic device, a memristor, would serve as the transistor in a circuit, though its workings would be more closely resemble a brain synapse, the junction between two neurons. The synapse receives signals from one neuron in the form of ions and sends a corresponding signal to the next neuron. A transistor is a conventional circuit, trans, uh, transmits information by switching between one of only two values, zero or one or on and off, and doing so only when the signal it receives in the form of an electric current is of a particular strength. In contrast, a memristor would work along a gradient, much like a synapse in the brain. Thereby, it, like when we were talking about that network, instead of it just sending flashes of on-off light, it would send like uh, spectrums of colors of different mm. light, and then that crams way more information through yeah. the same pipe. That's what this does too. Nice. We also talk about fuzzy, lo- like in the shit I program, like fuzzy logic, gray logic. It's this kind of thing where it it it, uh, it makes it infinitely almost more powerful because uh, you can store so much more information in the same amount of space. Pay attention. Anyway. Uh, the world is coming. So, anyway, that's happening. Brain synapse fucking microcomputers. <laughs> it doesn't, uh, though, say that you can implant them, which I'm really a little disappointed about. I was really hoping that would be a thing. Uh, well, that's what <laughs> Elon Musk is working on. Uh, Neuronet. Or Neuralink, yeah, well, inside the head. Well, right, because they would be able to cut. Did you see what that means? Yeah, they having cut, a bunch of they cut your scalp open. <laughs> they take like a fucking hole saw. Yeah, they hole saw out a chunk of your skull because you don't need that. They replace that exact size chunk of your skull with a first. They insert like super thin platinum Rods. wires. Yeah. And they just feed them into your brain where they need to connect. Yep. And then this puck goes back in your skull. They sew the skin up over it. Never see it's even there. You charge it like you charge wirelessly charge your cell phone. You charge the computer up with like a wireless charger. You just like put it on and then it just woo, 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 <laughs> inductively charges it. Oh my. Yeah. But then has Bluetooth connectivity, all that kind of shit. That's how that's going to work. So it's not like it's not going to be obtru- uh, intrusive like the Matrix no, uh-uh. where they jam the thing in the back of their neck. You're not even going to fucking see them, man. Yep. Ultimately. So the first thing that they're going to use it for is for yep. people with severe yep. epilepsy. That's interesting. Because they can literally, the way he explained it is they can literally feed the wires into the parts of the brain without disturbing the brain. Uh-huh. His claim, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, or, or causing any kind of trauma. And or very minute. And then uh, when a grand mal seizure starts to happen, the microprocessor would detect it and re- and send the opposite Signals. signal 
to cancel it out in real time immediately. Wow. So the person that would we could be having grand mal seizures may never even know it's ha- could could get to the point where they wouldn't even know it was happening. Wow. Because this thing could react so fast and shut it down before it, it affected them. That's pretty cool. It's cool shit, dude. Yeah, man. I'm getting mine. I don't know what I'm gonna get it for. You I want to be able seizures. to seizures. No, I'm gonna get my in case. I'm gonna get mine so I can play video games, man. I was gonna plug like Bluetooth oh. straight to the computer and just be like, oh. <laughs> I'll get. I'll, I'll I'll use it to write code too. But um, so yeah. this this one comes from uh, Express UK. Archaeology breakthrough: entire Roman city discovered buried underground. Well, that's where buried things generally are it's un- underground. <laughs> yeah, it's a little redundant. I guess it could be buried in trash, right? What were they doing underground? Uh, scientists have discovered an entire Roman town using ground-penetrating radar. They look very excited. Yeah, they do. And well-dressed. Archaeologists were able to take a detailed look of the layout and building hidden beneath the soil using a quad bike and other sophisticated machines. They were able to locate the hidden treasure with radio waves. The discovered town known as... Help me out here, Mr. Roman history guy. Fileri well, Novi. Novi for sure. Yeah. Um uh, yeah, I, Fowleri, I, I think is right. Fowleri Novi. Yeah. Uh, situated near Rome, played host to a baths complex, a temple, and a market. Oh, that's cool. Everybody used to like getting naked and getting in the water, didn't they? They liked the Romans liked their baths. Right? It's a thing. It was. Amongst a uh, social thing. Now we just stand up <laughs> and squirt it on ourselves and call out of anyway. Amongst other, most people shower is what I'm getting at. Uh, oh. Amongst other finds, researchers from universities of Cambridge and Ghent revealed they came across a unique public monument unlike anything compared to the other relics of ancient Rome. <gasps> mm. What could it be, Mr. Smith? Oh my gosh, I don't know. Also hidden below was a large theater, housing complexes for the working class, and water pipe system. Nice. The site is a hotspot for fascinating finds. And is well studied and is a well studied Roman site. On the brink of Rome, 30 miles north, the town is a product of battle between the Romans and Faliscans and Faliscan people. Faliscan? Faliscan? I don't know. Uh, people who inhabited the Lazo region of Italy. Oh, yeah, my buddy from Italy is going to listen to this and. Be like, dude. Uh, a, a, con- <laughs> a contest in which Rome was eventually victorious. You got one of those two. I was thinking the same thing. My buddy Luca. <laughs> uh, hi, Lorenzo. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, Luca. <laughs> they conquered the natives in 241 BC, taking possession of their weapons, slaves, and other territorial boasts. Yes. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I'm good. Yeah. Faleri was uh, demolished, uh, demoting the f- Faliscans, <laughs> Faliscans and their language non-existent for a century. And that's the problem we're having right now. <laughs> the language went with it. Bye-bye. So. <laughs> we don't know how to say this word. Well, I so guess we that's found it. a new city. Yeah. I mean, I don't guess. I guess. Well, they did the was... whole thing without digging anything up. Yeah. They mapped the whole thing. But and, it's and not. It's underground ground. just because it was like. Old and, Old, and okay. sacked. Okay. Was what they're saying, but... See, I was thinking underground, like, caves. No, I mean, let me put this back up, this picture, uh, if I can find it. Okay? Yeah. I mean, that's significant. Because that's years and years of excavation to uncover that. Mm-hmm. They just ran around on a quad bike with something they were towing behind it, and boom, here's everything that's under the ground. Find the interest... Like, okay, look, we've excavated... An apartment. We don't need to... Uh, we've excavated 50 apartments. We don't need to excavate any more apartments right. right now. We need to find, like, other shit. Yeah. Okay, well, over here's a temple complex. Over here's the baths. Over here's a statue, a yep. city circle. Uh, they can see where all that is now. Absolutely. Yeah. And and focus on that stuff because of these new technologies. Get to the crux of the matter. And well. you don't uh, pollute the site by digging everything up and seeing what you can find. We're waste resources. Exactly. Yeah, it becomes way more specific. I think it's going to uh, compress discoveries. Yes. The rate at which discoveries are made. Same thing with the LIDAR. Exactly. Out there yep. in the middle regions of the Americas. Yep. yep. Okay, uh, so we did that. 
All right, this one comes from Gizmodo. Ancient Roman board game found in Norwegian burial mound. Ancient Roman board game. Now, ancient, meaning, is there like a limit? Uh, 1,007-year-old, 700-year-old board game, including rare elongated dice, dating back to the Roman Iron Age, has been unearthed in Norway. Is that in any way surprising, though, 1,700 no. years ago? The Romans pretty much ruled fucking everything, right? Yeah, and they played board games. And so with, those it, kind of dice in that picture are the kind that they had in the game of Ur. They're like sticks that there's one side that's blank, and then there's other sides that have C. The one in the second to the right is blank. Yeah, stay on the, the mic. <laughs> and then the other ones have different, uh, like that's got, yeah. that's a four- a zero, one, two, three. Oh, I see. Four, I see the little markings five. on it. Yeah. Yeah. So you would toss those and they would come up any of these numbers, including zero. Okay. And that's how they would, that's what their dice was at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and it looks like those are like token pieces that they would potentially move around on a wooden board yeah. that probably didn't make it. Bend this down a little bit and you won't have to <laughs> like look around at this, the, the, your screen. Oh, this? Yeah. Okay. See, now you can see. <laughs> You've been, like, hiding behind. I have. <laughs> oh, no, my look at it. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I can see through the screen. My point is, is when I grabbed this, I thought that, you know, this was going to be, like, way before than we were supposed to find it. But Well, there's games older that we than that that we still play, like the game of Ur and Backgammon. Backgammon. Yeah, right, it's really those, ancient, right? Yeah. Both of those are, like, the two most ancient games. Really? That we've hmm. ever uncovered. I don't, then I'm not going to bother with this because this isn't telling us anything new other than, ooh, look, we found something pretty. <laughs> it's not surprising in any way, right? Um, I mean, not really. I mean, it, it, the Romans it, from were... a cultural aspect, if they knew ha what the rules of the game were, which is always the thing that's hardest to know, right? Uh, how exactly they played the game. You can know some things, like obviously it was dice, there's pieces, you're probably moving them if you're rolling dice, and there's probably some sort of a board upon which you were moving them, right? Right. But the actual rules of the game would give you a lot of insight into the cultural attitudes of the people of that time and place. So just having just having the pieces is not enough. No. You've got to know How you what were the them. rules of the game, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. Because, and if you know that, then that gives a huge amount of cultural insight in terms of what that culture considered to be important in past times. I mean, like, consider how Monopoly is such a big deal in the 20th century and for the reasons why it is, right? Sure, because we sure. can all identify yeah. with that whole economic system to some degree, right? And it would be the same way then, too. You know, is it a war game? Is it a competitive game? Is it a game based on luck? Is there strategy involved? Does the pieces represent soldiers or do they represent kings? You know, there's a lot that you can mm -hmm. figure out if you know. Lesson from Monopoly <laughs> is that you want to be the bank. Yeah. <laughs> That's the lesson and from Monopoly. No other type of player, just a, a, the banker. You just the, the one that wins <laughs> is the bank, really, at the end of the day. <laughs> uh, one more yeah, article sure. here, and uh, we'll wrap up for the week anyway. So this one comes from Maxim. Um, so UFC Fight Island confirmed for Abu Dhabi. Fight Island. Fight Island. Now that sounds interesting. Yeah. Although I don't think it's going to be a tropical island where they turn fighters loose and the last man wins or anything well, see now, quite as interesting as that. I think it's going to be something with different. The prisons being so overpopulated, that was kind of my idea. Is this Fight Island? Yeah, yeah. You could you could That's drop these dystopian, prisoners. Man. Well, you know, the prisoners that are either going to be killed or life, and you are have an overpopulation, you put them on an <laughs> island, right? And whoever survives or works out their differences and coexists can pretty much live their lives on that island, which, you know, may be better than dying or living your life well, in prison. I kind of did that. I mean, unless I'm, a, and I could be pissing a bunch of people off here, and I don't mean to, uh, 
but maybe I'm my history is askew. But as I understand, didn't Great Britain do that to Australia? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and they made a whole nation. I and, mean, and it's like got some of the hottest fucking women in the world, it, man. And didn't turn out it, bad for did them. Not turn out bad at all. <laughs> They're them. probably happier than being under England's thumb. Of course, they do live a place where spiders are as big as your face and weird shit. Like there's deadly poisonous stuff everywhere and. It all rains, trying to kill you. It rains like spiders. It rains and burns. And <laughs> yeah, just... <laughs> but they have lobster and shrimp, and that's pretty good. Doesn't suck. No. But so does Maine, and they don't have spiders the size of your face. <laughs> they have moose. <laughs> <laughs> the size of your car. The size of your house. <laughs> uh, the news comes after John Jones and Jorge Masvidal criticized UFC pay for top athletes. That's like a whole big deal. It's official USC 251 will take place on a newly secured, quote, fight island in the Middle East. Fitting. Uh, UFC boss Dana White confirmed with ESPN's first take that the venue is located uh, Yaz Island in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. The island serves as a location on which the MMA organization can hold events during the coronavirus crisis. Um, Abu Dhabi, believe it or not, is huge into sponsoring, uh, like grappling and different fights. I never would have guessed, but it's like a hotbed for pro fighters and up and coming fighters too uh, to go and compete and shit. Wow. It's wild. I never, I kept seeing the name. I was like, what the fuck does Abu Dhabi got to do? <laughs> but they're like really big uh, into it. Uh, UFC 251 will be the. F- Will be the first on will be the first on July 11th. The main card features three title fights: a welterweight bout between Karamu Usman and Gilbert Burns, and a featherweight bout between Alex Volkanovsky and yeah. Max Holloway, and a bantamweight fight between Peter Yan and Jose Aldo. Jose Aldo. Jose Aldo. Uh, UFC fight cards will follow on July 15th, 18th, and 25th. We're literally just going to Ass Island right now to pull off these fights because the hardest thing to do right now is to get people into the country from other parts of the world, said Dana White. So they just went out and like fucking they're, they're making an island with which they can go and hold sporting events on until this all blows over. Interesting. I don't know that this is going to. I mean, what's next? Like basketball games, NFL, like, you know, they're going to build like. An it's kind of like Enter the Dragon, right? Then they yeah, all go out to like an island. Right. And then... <laughs> but, I mean, there's something to it, though. I think it's kind of interesting that, that they're doing it this way because now they can just fly. It's an island. They can fly people in from all over the world because they're the only people on the island. You, you follow me? Like, So it ain't yeah. like flying them into an international airport, driving them through fucking New York City. There could so, be some bad bouts on the side there's there. There's no rules. There's yeah. no restrictions. There's no... Yeah. I mean, well, it's a province. I'm, I'm guessing it's close enough that it's like a province of Abu, of the uh, United Arab Emirates. I don't said know. That. If it's, is it? Okay. But if you got far enough out into like international waters or something that yeah. shit wouldn't apply, you could do anything you wanted. I think that probably was the underlying idea. Idea, behind, yeah. Behind the dragon movie, the inner dragon. And now they're doing it for real. Uh, like uh, art imitating life. <laughs> or life imitating art in this case, right? <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, and we are a true global business. Uh, we're the only ones that are pulling off live sports right now. And if I continue to do fights in the United States, I'm going to burn out all of my American talent. So now we've got Yas, uh, Yas Island ready to go. It's set up. So this is getting the fighters right because the only ones that he can fight right now are, have to be in the U S cause you can't get into the U S from other countries. Mm. So, uh, Khabib, uh, and some of these other guys that are in like, I know he's like Uzbekistan or something like that. Like these other countries, they can't get here. So they can't fight. Hmm. This is interesting, man. Yeah. Give them melee weapons and shit too, dude. <laughs> like fucking let them go. <laughs> Gas Island is reportedly set up with an arena, hotel, training facilities, dining establishments, and a 10 square mile safety zone in which only athletes, coaches, UFC staff, and other limited personnel will be granted access. It's like, All right. it's, yeah. It's like Lolita Island, but they beat the shit out of each other. Like Jeffrey Epstein's fucking weird yeah. island. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, but not like that. <laughs> yeah, not that way. 
Well, that's pretty cool. I'm excited about that, man. Um, not that I'll fucking pay the pay-per-view price to watch it, but I'm glad that they're pulling it off. Yeah. Look, where there's a will, there's a way. And necessity's the mother of invention and all these other fucking cliches. Where right? there's like, a whip, there's a, there is a way. That's from uh, the Lord of the Rings uh, 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 cartoon. That's the, right. Uh, not Lord of the Rings, the uh, Hobbit cartoon. Well, well, yeah, yeah. No, it was from the Lord one of the, of the Rings cartoons. Like the second one, I think. Obscure. With the really rotoscope. That. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, they had people act the scenes out, and then they laid like a piece of paper up on the screen and frame by frame redrew it and animated it. Yep. It's really weird, weird yeah. yeah, to watch. It's a weird effect. They do mm-hmm. it in the animation called Wizards 2 by Ralph Bansky. Yeah, yeah. I saw that. Uh, I've seen that before. Where there's a whip, there is a way. Mm-hmm. That's the, <laughs> yeah, work all day, all day, all day, right? <laughs> That was the, uh, not the trolls, that was the... Uh, goblins. The goblins, yeah. Uh, portrayed much differently in Peter Jackson's version of, yeah. of those uh, of those books. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love those movies, man. They're great. Yeah, yeah. All right, Bubba, you got anything else we want to cover? Um, Probably. No, we can't talk about little people clergy. That's all right. It. Okay, We. are you going to write that paper? Not yet. Okay. I was just wondering. I'm just anyway, throwing that out there. Hey, the Overwatch crew, man. My birthday came and went. My Overwatch crew was like super nice to me. They gave me like loot boxes and oh, stuff. Oh, that's cool. Birthday. Yeah, it was kind of fun. But uh, I was pointing at the computer, not telling you to look at anything. Oh, okay. I play Overwatch. <laughs> on the I was looking. Uh, <laughs> what the fuck am I? Uh, who's here? <laughs> All right, man, then we'll wrap up there. Um, Okay. See you guys all next week. Thanks for listening, everyone. Check us out at www.noshitcast.com. It's K-N-O-W-S-H-I-T-C-A-S-T.com. Make sure you hit those like and subscribe buttons. Leave us a message. Uh, If we like it, we might put it on the show. If we don't like it, we might make fun of you. Blessings. Blessings. (laughs) Blessings. Give us a share. We'd greatly appreciate it. And we will catch you all next time. Thanks for listening, everybody. Bye. Bye.